Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 8th lecture in the numerical methods and computing. So, in the, so there are two things before we start. First thing is that, I mean, feel free to contact me if you want to discuss something. If you, you have a question or something, we can just set the time and uh, we can sit together and solve the problem, okay? This is one thing. The second thing is that do not forget about tomorrow's uh, tutorial session. Right, it will be here. I hope you have already started going through the material. Yes. Sorry? Really? Okay. Do you hear me, the others? Okay. Well, I guess it's working as far as I know. Because I can. Sorry? I'm sorry if I'm being rude. No. <laughs> Why rude? <laughs> Okay, let's, let's increase the volume. So do you think it's better? No? No? <clears throat> so I'm turning now. It's on. So it should be okay, or? I don't know. So it goes there. Do you hear me? Back there. Yes? Okay. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, do not forget about tomorrow's session. And this is start going through the material. Otherwise, I mean, it's not going to be very fruitful for you. Anyway, let's continue our discussion. So, in the last lecture, we were mainly discussing Gaussian elimination. So, I hope you had time to go through the material and let me know if there is anything unclear, okay? We can discuss it more. But okay, the main idea was that we have a linear system and the coefficient matrix A in general is a full matrix. And what we want to do with Gaussian elimination is just to make it uh, triangular, in particular upper triangular. So we, we just went through the, uh, the error control and we discuss in the end the solvability of the linear system. So there is one uh, application of this Gaussian elimination. So I would like to just go with this, start with this today, before going to the other, to other methods. So. Uh, do you remember what was the definition of inverse matrix? So we had A inverse. If we, we multiply A from left by A inverse or from right, then we get the identity matrix. Okay, this is one of the things that we learned in the first part of the course. So basically we can write this last part in the matrix form. So this is A, this is A inverse, and this is I. So what we want to do is that we want to use the Gaussian elimination method to solve linear systems in order to find, to find A inverse, the inverse of matrix A. So the general formula that we had for A inverse was a joint of A divided by determinant of A, right? So now we would like to just introduce an alternative method to calculate A inverse. So for this, for this uh, purpose, as you see, I'm putting a tilde over A's, so which means that the, these A tilde IJ's are not known. And our task is to come up with a set of linear systems to solve to find these coefficients and then get the, the A inverse. So if you pick up the Jth column of the right hand side. So it is equal to the multiplication of the whole matrix A by the jth column of this A inverse or A tilde. Right? Because always we multiply each row by column, we get the corresponding element. So if we do this multiplication for all rows, we get all the elements on the column on the right hand side. So do you agree with me up to this point? 
So A multiplied by the column J is going to give us the Jth column of the right-hand side. But we shouldn't forget that on the right-hand side we have I, the identity matrix, which means that all elements are zero but, the, but those on the diagonal. Which means that for the Jth column, all elements are zero except the one at the Jth row. So here I can put so this is the, okay? So therefore I can write this matrix A multiplied by column, by the jth column, given the jth column of the right hand side, I can write it like this. And this EJ is exactly this vector. All are zero except the jth element, which is one. Of course, I can change j from 1 to n, right? So if I do that, then I can get different columns of this a tilde, which is, in, which is in fact our a inverse. So we shouldn't forget, our aim is to use Gaussian elimination to calculate a inverse. Or in general, solve linear systems instead of using the kind of the, the formal definition of A inverse. So do you remember in the last lecture we were discussing about having to, to add the column the, the, the right hand side vector to the right side of the coefficient matrix. So now we just do it for the whole right-hand side, which is matrix A. And then we do the Gaussian elimination. So if we do this, this coefficient matrix A is going to become an upper triangular matrix. This is exactly the aim of the Gaussian elimination. And of course, these elements belonging to I are going to change. So then I can start from the, 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 the last row and do the backward substitution and find the values of the, this A tilde that we had. So I can show an example here. This is matrix A and what we want to do is to come up with the linear system to calculate A inverse. So this is matrix A and the right hand side is I. So, I want to do Gaussian elimination, which means that I do not touch the first row, and what I do is that I go to the second row here, out of, I mean, two, and then I would like to get rid of the first element, too. So the question is that, what should be the multiplier if by which I multiply row one and add it to the row two, I'm going to get rid of these two, I mean, first element. This is minus 0.4, right? So, if row 1 is multiplied by 0.4, minus 0.4 is added to row 2. So the first row is untouched. The second one, so we are going to get rid of these two. If we multiply this 5 by minus 0.4, it gives us minus 2. So adding, adding, adding that to 2 is going to give us 0, and like this. So, now the question is that, how to calculate the coefficients? So, we shouldn't forget that this A inverse is A tilde 1, 1, A tilde 1, 2, A tilde 2, 1, A tilde 2, 2. So, the first element, the first column of this A inverse is here. This is the first column. Okay? And since it is the first column, we are going to pick up the first column of this extended matrix, on the right-hand side of the extended matrix. And we, are, we, we know how to solve this because we start from the second row. We directly get the value for a tilde 2, 1, and then put it back to the first row, and we get the value a tilde 1, 1. This is just exactly Gaussian elimination. So we ended up with this 
triangular matrix. And if you want to calculate the second column of this A inverse, which is here, so we are going to use this guy, the second column of the right-hand side of the extended matrix. And again, this is a triangular matrix, so we calculate these coefficients. So of course, I mean, this case that is two by two, perhaps following our direct definition for A inverse, which is adjoint of A divided by the determinant of A is like perhaps less computationally or de demanding and you need to have less effort. Sir? Yeah? Are we going to be told which method we should use? Yes. Exam? Yes. If not, just feel free to, uh, to use whatever. Yes. If, if it is meant that, I mean, you will be assessed in terms of just knowing one particular approach, you will be told so. Otherwise, Okay, so it was like a side note about one application of uh, solving linear systems. So here, be careful that if you want to get all elements of A inverse, if A is n by, one, n, by n, then need to solve n linear systems. As you saw here, I mean, we have two by two matrix, so we have system 1, which gives us the first column of A inverse, and then we have system 2. Sorry? So, sorry, here you mean? Ah, it's just, I mean, I had 0.4, so I, I just converted. Yeah. This is in fact 14 over 5, right? 8.2. Yeah. So there is one, so you inverse that, you get 5 over 14. Perfect. <clears throat> so we are going to stop talking about the Gaussian elimination at this point. We are going to move on to other approaches. But we are still in the direct methods. So, so far we have learned about the Kramer's rule as a direct method. And after that we learned about Gaussian elimination. And now there is a third approach that is called LU factorization. So if we have this matrix A, so again, as a recall, we are solving this system of equation, this linear system of equation. A is the coefficient matrix, X is the solution vector, and B is the right-hand side vector. Okay? So A can be decomposed as this. So it's the multiplication of L by U. So A is n by n, and also n is n by n, and u is n by n. So we can decompose A as a multiplication of L by u. And what are L and u? L is a lower triangular matrix, and u is an upper triangular matrix. This is very interesting, isn't it? So. This guy is going to be L, and this guy is going to be R. Which means that if you multiply these two, we can get matrix A. So how can it be useful to have such a decomposition for A? OK, let's look at the linear system that we have. A x is equal to B. So I substitute A by L multiplied by U. And what happens here is that I can recall this U multiplied by X to be Y. 
This is a new vector. Okay? And as a result of this, I can break this one linear system of equation of size n into two linear systems. So, first I have this equation. And then L multiplied by U is equal to B is the second equation. Is it clear what we have done? Just the magic is that, okay, substitute A by the multiplication of L and U, and then get two linear system from, that, from the original one. So why, why did we do it, I mean? Why do we need to have such a decomposition? Okay, we will see it. So first of all, if we have A, A is in general a full matrix. As you saw, I mean, either you have to use Kramer's rule or uh, Gaussian elimination, or you will see some iterative methods. But in this case, everything becomes very easy because first, this system, LU equals B. So we have a lower triangular matrix, and these are the solution y1 to yn, which have to be determined, and we have the right-hand side, b1 to bn. So how to solve this? Okay, so the first row can be directly solved. So we start from here. First we get y1, and this is very straightforward. We should need to divide b1 by l11, right? And after that, knowing y, y1, you're going to the second row, so then you can get y2. Since we are starting from the first row and going to the bottom, this is called forward substitution. And it's very easy. I mean, you do not, it's just algebraic, simple, simple algebra. So, okay, so as a result of this, we can obtain this vector y. So then, we put it in the second equation, where this calculated vector y is going to be our known right-hand side. Oh, yes. All right. No, no, that's good. Please remind me. Okay? So, we calculated y, we put it on the right-hand side. And again, here we have a triangular matrix, but this time, our coefficient matrix is the upper triangular matrix, which means that we start from here, from the bottom, from the last row. We can go directly calculate xn. Is the R matrix that the same as the U? No, no. A is L multiplied by U. Yeah, when you label it R, is that the same as U since I'm trying to do Oh, sorry. Yes, U. So I heard it. Oh, sorry. R, yes. So it's like left, right, or LU. Okay? So we start from the bottom, and from the last row, I'm going to toward the first row. So this is like a backward substitution. So as a result of this, we get Vector x, that was actually what we were looking for from the beginning. You should not forget, the aim was to solve for x. So we didn't want to go through this Gaussian elimination, but at the same time we wanted to have some triangular matrix because of their nice properties. We can just do this direct forward or backward substitution. That's why we are using this decomposition here, LU decomposition lower and upper triangular matrices. And then, okay, everything comes with, with the price, right? At the price, so here we, want, we had this matrix with, with this system, with the full matrix, we didn't want to solve this using Gaussian elimination. Now that we, we would like to use the nice properties of the triangular matrix, matrices, we have to do, do it twice. So we have two linear systems, but that's fine. So, was it clear why, why we did this decomposition? Just keep in mind. 
we like triangular matrices when we are using direct methods because of their nice properties like these forward and backward uh, substitutions. And if you look at MATLAB, it's quite straightforward to get this decomposition. So you just simply write LU parentheses A, so it returns to you matrix L and U. So it's a very standard and useful technique in linear algebra, this LU factorization or decomposition. So if you look at the slides, you would see, I mean, that there is uh, some formula for computing this L and U. For some reason, I do not have them here, but that's fine. Any questions, please? So, when we use this, we're getting given A and B, or we're calculating X and Y. You know, well, we're calculating Y in order to get X. Exactly. Okay. So we have two systems. This one is in terms of y. You solve for y, and when you get it, put it on the right-hand side of the second one. It becomes your known kind of right-hand side. And then solve for x. And we shouldn't forget that x is actually the, the vector that we are looking for, the solution vector. And y is some kind of intermediate step that we have introduced. Okay, so in the same kind of venue, kind of with the same idea, we have another type of decomposition, and that is called Cholesky decomposition. So it's the name of a person who discovered this. But this time we have a bit kind of more restriction about matrix A. So if we have this matrix A as a square matrix n by n, and this A is Hermitian. Have you heard about this? So we call a matrix A Hermitian if we have this property. So this bar, so if A is this, so it's like conjugate transpose. So this guy is just complex conjugate. Which means that if you have a matrix A with complex numbers in general, you should do a transpose of that A, but at the same time also calculate the complex conjugate. Yeah. How to understand? Okay. Yeah. So for all elements, we should have this property that each element that you pick up, okay, A, I, J should be equal to the complex conjugate of A, J, I. Of, exactly, of its transpose. Which means that if you have, a, you have A as a real matrix with no complex number, what happens is that this is going to reduce to what? A equals to A transpose. Right? Because, I mean, complex conjugates have, has no meaning for the, for the real numbers. So therefore, if A is real, then A T should be A. So that A is Hermitian. Okay? So this is the first condition that A should have. A second condition is that A has to be positive definite, which means that all of the eigenvalues of A have to be positive. So if we have these two, composi these two conditions, so a bit more restrict than what we have for the LU decomposition, then we can decompose A as L multiplied by L transposed. And this L is a lower triangular matrix. So can you quickly tell me what is the difference of this compared to, to the previous one, LU factorization? So there we had A 
as a multiplication of L by U, but here we have L by L transpose T. So basically, if we have these good two properties and our matrix can be decomposed using Cholesky decomposition, then we only need to have one matrix, L. And if you transpose it, you get the second one. Instead of calculating both L and U, yes. About? Yes, yes, okay, we, we, we are not there, please stop. Yes, yes, I, I know, I appreciate that point. I will go through it now, sorry. Okay? Good, so this is exactly kind of the same type of decomposition, multiplication of two triangular metrics. L is lower, so L transpose is upper triangular. And as you see here, I mean, yes, you're right, the definitions are a bit different. I guess there's a typo in the slides, we should fix that. I will do it hopefully today, tomorrow. Okay? This one. This is the correct one. No, one, two. This lower bound should be one. Because we do not have L0. Yeah, but the, yes, that's a good point, thank you. And we are aware of that, we will fix the typo. Thanks. But this is the formula that you have to follow if you want to calculate the elements of L in the Cholesky decomposition. So it's quite simple. So for instance, L11, we are, I'm, I'm looking at the first formula. So it's uh, A11. And L22, since this summation starts from 1 to i minus 1. This time i is 1, so 1 to 1 we have a value. So it becomes a22 minus l1. Sorry, l21 square. But we do not have l21. We use the second formula, l21 is 1 over l11, a21, which we know. And that's it, because this i minus 1 is going to give us 0. Just be careful that the second formula is going to start from, from, I mean, j is going to start from i. So it's for j larger than i. And you do not need to memorize this. If, you're, if it's needed, you will be given this formula, okay? And from now on, we are going to have different types of formula for different approaches. So I try to just remind you which, we, which one we expect you to know by heart and which one not. Okay? And later, I guess we will come up with a kind of a list of formula before the exam. I will send it to you. Yes? Why does it have to be positive? Why? Yeah. So it's just something that's. Uh, <laughs> You need, to, you need it during the calculation and coming up with this formula. Otherwise, for instance, the square root, you may get uh, negative values uh, under the square root. So, is it clear? So, we do Cholesky decomposition, we get the uh, lines matrix L, which is lower triangular. If you multiply L by L transpose, we can recover A. And if you look at MATLAB, this is the common there. Control A. But the matrix that you get is R, which is in fact an upper triangular matrix, which means that if you run MATLAB, be careful. This R is actually L transpose T. So you do not get L di directly, you get L transpose. So very similar to what we did in the LU factorization. That's why we would like to have this A L L sorry. L the transpose. So we have this system of equation. We substitute A by L L transpose. And again, this L transpose X is going to be called Y. And exactly the same thing that we did for LU factorization. So we get first system, and second system. So the first one is L y is equals to b, and L transpose t x is y. 
So can you please tell me how to solve this first equation for y? We have a lower triangular matrix, so what, what happens? Sir? Yeah. Exactly. So the first one, we have only one unknown because the multipliers of the other from y to yn is zero. So we only have y1 as unknown. We can directly calculate it from the first row. So we start from here. So we do this forward substitution. And then once we know y, we put it at the right hand side exactly the same as previous. And then we can calculate this x. And this time we have backward substitution. OK? Any question about LU and Trulisky decomposition? This is just important to grasp the idea why we are doing this decomposition. So with this, I have a good news for you. So this is like the end of the direct methods that we wanted to talk about. So I would like to have a summary and move on to the iterative methods. So again, we had this linear system, AX equals B, right? And we have direct methods. In particular, we looked at Kramer's rule, Gaussian elimination, LU factorization, and Trulisky decomposition. All except the first one, which is the Kramer's rule. These guys, they aim to give us triangular matrices. So the idea was to convert A to triangular matrices, because then we could do this forward backward substitutions. But for instance, in case of Gaussian elimination, we observed that, OK, it requires a lot of operations. And one has to be careful, especially about this, the issue of the uh, error and how it propagates into the solution. But in the end, we learned, OK, we have different approaches. We can directly apply them, solve the equation, linear system of equation, and find the solution through a number of steps. This is a finite number of steps. And, but we don't know. Maybe that finite number is large. Maybe a small, it depends on the system. And before everything, we have to make sure that the linear system is solvable. And for that, we introduced some approach last, last, sec, the last lecture, was just comparing rank of matrix A and the extended matrix A by B. Anyway, so we had these direct methods. Most of them wanted to give us some triangular matrix instead of A. But in practical applications, so imagine that we are solving the turbulent flow around an airplane. We have millions of degrees of freedom. We have millions of grid points. And each time a step, we have to solve a million by million, or I don't know, 200 million by 200 million linear systems. Could it be doable to just adopt Gaussian elimination? Nope. OK? So I guess you agree with me that they are very nice. They are mathematically very clean. But for the practical application in computation, in, in scientific computing, they are not the method of choice. Because the computational cost is quite high, and most of cases, it's impossible. And also, just imagine if you have like a grid around an airplane, like. And 200 is not much, actually. It's like 500 million cells or grid points. Then this is the size of the matrix A for each quantity, for velocity, for pressure, for temperature. So this also is problematic in terms of the memory, the, com the computer memory. How do you want to save this amount of data? That's not possible. So that's why we are moving to what we call iterative methods. So, exact, I mean, to me, it's like moving from mathematics and calculation into numerics and computation. So, whenever we talk about iter iterative methods, iterations, we are talking about numer numerical methods, which can be applied in practice in computer codes for different computational algorithms. All right? 
So now we are moving to the iterative methods. So as, a, as an essence, this is what we do. We assume uh, an initial guess for the solution of x. Okay, so we, here we call it initial guess for x, and we usually show it by this superscript 0. So this is the initial guess. And then we do iteration. So this matrix A, the coefficient matrix, is going to be broken into several triangular matrices or sub-matrices instead of a big one. Okay, so locally we are going to kind of play with A, make it uh, triangular. And we do that because we, then we can use forward and backward substitutions. But the good thing is that then we have small systems, these uh, triangular matrices, so the associated computation is quite low, so it's tractable, but we have broken A into many of these matrices. So, I mean, in the end, maybe the computational cost is not that cheap. Of course, there are methods to kind of optimize those things. And we are talking about iteration, so which means that we assume something, we solve a set of equations, we update our solution, and then we have to check a convergence criteria. Have we, do we have a converged solution? If yes, stop. Otherwise, continue. Go to the next iteration. And do this iteration, repeat these iterations until you have converged solution. So it's not like in the calculation, in the direct methods, that you do all the efforts and in the end, all of a sudden, you get your solution. But here we start from something and we refine this assumption and move this toward the actual and accurate solution. So there are different methods for these iterations that help us to move this initial guess for this solution X toward the actual or the, the true solution. And now this is exactly something that we are going to start with. So I guess through this session and I mean next lecture, we are going to look at the iterative methods for the linear systems. And it's quite uh, very important. I, I'm sure that in many, many other courses during your degree, you will need that. So, but before that, we need to have some kind of uh, background, what we mean by iteration. So as we said, we have this linear system. We want to solve it iteratively, which means that we need to start from an initial guess, x0, and we construct a sequence of the solutions. So from x0, you get x1. x1 is a solution after the first iteration. From x1, you get x2. So it's the solution after the second iteration. And you continue it. And we, uh, the good thing is that if everything goes well, if you have a good method, these iterations are going to lead to an xk, which is close enough to our actual solution. This means convergence. But this is infinite. This is the mathematical thing. But in practice, we should make this infinite some finite number. It can be large, it can be small. It depends on the problem, the algorithm, and how we do it. So if you would like to write this down, the whole process, it means that we start from 0, we get x1, then we do it until we end up with xk. So we have some transitional tool or function. If we plug in a solution, we can go to the next step. So this function is usually dependent on all this solution, which means that we have to keep the history of the solution, the iterations. But this, this is not usually the case. What we have in practice is that the current solution or the new solution is only a function of the solution at the previous iteration. So this is not the case, and this is what we have in practice. It doesn't mean that this is wrong, so this, this is too complicated, but we are going to consider only this case. So the current solution is only dependent on the solution at the previous iteration. So we do not to keep track of all solutions more than one step before. And also, the other good thing is that 
this function fk, which is responsible to transfer our old solution to the current one, is going to be fixed. If it can be fixed, and usually this is the case for us. So this f, if it is fixed, it's not changing with the iteration. If we have this index k, which means that f is changing with iteration, then we, uh, we have not stationary solution, uh, function. But here, we are going to consider cases where f is fixed. It's not changing with iteration, and so it's stationary. And in particular, this fk that we are going to deal with in this course has this linear format. Okay? I mean, after we go through the methods and examples, this becomes more clear, but this is like the mathematical formality that we need to understand those approaches. So this fk is going to be linear, which means that if I plug xk minus 1 at iteration k minus 1 instead of k, x, then it will give me xk. I mean, through this linear transformation. But, so we would like to understand under which conditions our iterations are going to be converging. So to this end, I start from here. So I say that, okay, both solution at its, the current iteration k and also the previous one are going to satisfy the given equation. So, which means that a, a x, k, it has to be b and a, xk minus 1 has to also be So this means that xk is a minus b and also x at k minus 1 has to be a minus b. So this is exactly I do, what I do here, a minus b, and also this is what I do. So this, this is just the general transformation that we have considered. So if we do so, so we have matrix matrix multiplication, which means that in the end, this CK here, this constant, is going to be written as CKB. So CK is a matrix that we can find it. This is identity matrix minus BK multiplied by A inverse. So, <clears throat> With this, we can transform this definition to this. But what is the take-home message here? The take-home message is that, so we have this type of linear transformation, that if we have the old solution, then we multiply it by some matrix B, and we add a matrix of vector beta to it, so we can update our solution. These are the type of methods that we are going to consider in this course. So what is the condition, I mean, that is required for the convergence of these iterations? The condition is that we have this norm of b to the power k. This is the power, not iteration, because it's not in the parentheses. And for, for this to hold, we need to have the maximum eigenvalue of B, whatever this matrix B is. This, the, the, its maximum eigenvalue has to be smaller than one. Okay? So this is the, this is the true solution here. So at the case iteration, so this is the norm. Norm is going to measure a, 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 just the size of a vector. So here the vector is the deviation of xk from actual solution. And this norm has to be smaller than this magnitude multiplied by another norm. So this is the initial error that we have. How far our initial guess was from the actual solution? And this is how far we are after the kth iteration from the actual solution. So what does it, I mean, well, what makes sense is that after kth iteration, we should be closer to the actual solution, 
right? So whatever that distance was, this norm was at the beginning, multiplied by this norm of b to the power k has to be the upper bound of the distance at the current iteration. If I want to make it just short, what you do is that if whenever you see this form, okay, whenever you see this form, so max eigenvalue of b this has to be less than or equal to 1. So this is the condition for convergence. Again, just come up with this linear transformation. Yes, please. So how would we actually know what the true value is? Is it not what we're trying to find? Yeah, exactly. We don't know it. Very, very, very bright point. So we don't know what is x is. But somehow, in practice, we should find the convergence criterion, and we are going to go through it. So, okay. So this is what we do. I mean, as you mentioned, we don't know what this x is. So we don't know the value of this norm and also this norm. But instead, we can set an epsilon. This is like a very small value that we set. This is just going to impose a condition for the convergence. So if it's 10 to the power minus 4, then we get a solution. If you make it 10 to the power of minus 6, which means that more, our solution is going to be most probably more accurate at that compared to the case of 10 to the power of minus 4, because we, had, we have had a more restricted, restrictive condition. Okay? But when we do iteration, in general, we are not aware of the maximum number of iterations that we need at the beginning. So when you start a method, you don't know how many iterations you need to do. What you can impose is that, okay, I would like my solutions become close enough to the actual solution. So what you do is that you set this epsilon. But you can't set the exact number of iterations that is required to get to that error. Or to get the error, I mean, to an error below this threshold. Of course, there is like a criterion to estimate n, but this is not accurate. So it says that, so this epsilon is given by the user, so sorry, 10 to the power minus 4. The log of 10 to the power minus 4 is going to be negative. But that's no problem because this, this is going to be divided by log of this rho b, and this rho b is the maximum magnitude of the eigenvalues of b. Okay? And since for convergence, this has to be below 1, then this logarithm is also negative. So we have no problem to get a positive value for this n. So if epsilon is fixed, can you tell me what happens if I, if the maximum, or if the eigenvalues of b with maximum magnitude gets smaller and smaller, which means becomes closer and closer to 0? What does happen? So then n is going to decrease. Okay? So this matrix B that we had it, so again, this is B here. And this is exactly the transformation matrix. B is applied to the old solution, and some is going to, we are going to have some additive matrices, then we get the new solution. So Max, the, we calculate the eigenvalues of B, and the maximum magnitude of the eigenvalues has to be below 1 for convergence. And that is going to define the rate of convergence. So the rate of convergence so this is going to determine 
the convergence rate. So smaller eigenvalues or eigenvalues with smaller magnitudes closer to zero are going to result in faster convergence for the iterative methods. But if we have this very close to one, the convergence is going to be delayed. And regarding to the valid question there, we, do, we are not aware of the exact solution of X. We don't know what the accurate solution of X is, but still we need to provide the convergence criterion in practice to stop the loop or iterations that we know that I, we are not aware of the when they will converge. So for that, we use this method. Of course, there are some other possibilities, but for now you can consider this. So what is R? R is the residual vector. So basically at each step, you have, you have the solution X. So we know that we, we are looking for the solution of this system. So in the end, we, we would like to have this AX minus B has to be zero, right? This is something that we want to do in the end. So if you put the solution at the kth iteration here, this is not going to be exactly zero. It's going to give us this RK. This is the residual. So what we want to have is to have this RK converging after a finite number of iterations. So we impose this epsilon. Based on our initial guess, we have this residual that we can calculate. And after the kth iteration, we can calculate this RK. So whenever we have this condition in place, which means that the norm of R k is less than epsilon multiplied by the norm of R zero, then this is convergence. And we explained norm in the previous lectures. I mean, probably you need to look at it if you can't remember. It was, we have different measures for this, but probably L2 norm is the one that we would like to go with. So I, rec I mean, something like L2 norm is the square root of x1 square x2 square plus xm square. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for today and see you tomorrow. Thank you.